I'm Crosby Kemper, the director of the Kansas City Public Library. It's a pleasure to, uh, to welcome you to uh, the month of September at the library, which is going to be a fabulous month tonight. Tonight is fabulous because we have Justin Martin with his great new uh, biography of Frederick Law uh, Olmsted. And, and Olmsted is a, 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 a truly fascinating uh, character, uh, a, you know, a, a, a bringing to uh, uh, an apotheosis, if you will, an American engagement with, with what was a worldwide movement uh, uh, for, for parks, uh, for an aesthetic consideration of, uh, of human civilization. Uh, uh, particularly in cities, uh, but he was much more than that. You know, he was a great abolitionist, and uh, his his books on the South, on his trips through the South, uh, that he wrote originally as journalism for for New York uh, newspapers, uh, when published, had a huge influence. Uh, you would discover in this book that he had an influence on uh, Marx when he was writing Das Kapital, on John Stuart Mill, on Darwin, and on Dickens. And just through the, his influence on those four men, his influence uh, must have reached uh, virtually uh, the entire world. He had a big influence on the state of Missouri. Uh, he, he, he founded, uh, ran uh, the United States Sanitary Commission during the, the Civil War. Uh, it was essentially the precursor of the Red Cross. Uh, and it not only uh, dealt with hygiene, uh, dealt with the, uh, the, the wounded uh, soldiers, uh, uh, the destruction of cities, uh, uh, the, the recreation of health and uh, uh, wherever war went, uh, it also had an influence in other ways. It had an influence, again, partly through uh, uh, Olmsted's concern with uh, 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 slavery, uh, ending of slavery, uh, and, and the induction of, uh, of African Americans into, into citizenship, uh, on things like education. Uh, a, uh, a, uh, an offshoot of the United States Sanitary Commission created in Missouri called the Western Sanitary Commission created the first extensive uh, urban education for African Americans in the United States in St. Louis. Uh, and and that, that, again, is, is something that Olmsted uh, can take, uh, take some credit for. Um, Central Park, obviously, is his greatest monument, and I'm, I'm sure Justin will, will talk about that. Uh, I, I will quote one thing he said about, uh, and I quote from Justin's book, uh, uh, about Central Park. Uh, he said it was a democratic development of the highest significance. Uh, and he said that as he, as he watched after Central Park opened initially and watched every kind of New Yorker come into that park and, and use that park, uh, a coming together of New Yorkers that hadn't really been seen for anything before that except maybe a riot. Um, <laughs> and he's the precursor uh, in, in many ways. There's a debate uh, going on, a debate w went on all day with a, <clears throat> a leading citizen of Kansas City between me and and her about uh, the influence he had on George Kessler. Uh, there's uh, George Kessler, who, as many of you know, most of you know, created Kansas City's parks and boulevard system, uh, and uh, which may, in some ways, be seen as as the as the ultimate creation of the city beautiful movement of the of the of the parks movement of the picturesque movement, uh, uh, the worldwide uh, movement uh, to beautify cities. Um, and I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Justin talk about that in the question and answer se session. We can, we can get into the, the debate. Um, but I do want to quote from a 1917 uh, book uh, that uh, is in our Missouri Valley Special Collections, the Proceedings of the Ninth National Conference on City Planning, to which spoke uh, J.C. Nichols, uh, George Kessler, and Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr., the son of Frederick Law uh, Olmsted. Uh, and, and in it, Kessler taught, Olmsted says he knows absolutely nothing about Kansas City, but he's prepared to opine on uh, interurbans, uh, the, the construction of a park along the Blue, uh, Blue River, uh, and, and other things. Uh, but, he, but he tips his hat to Kessler as the creator of, uh, of one of the, the great uh, park systems uh, in, the, uh, in the world. And, but Kessler uh, said uh, in, in his speech, uh, he said that city planning is implemented through parks uh, and boulevards, and he said uh, that Kansas City is full of topographical eccentricities. I love that phrase, topographical eccentricities, and it's in the way you use those eccentricities, not get rid of those eccentricities, uh, that, uh, that, that determines whether or not uh, you, you've, you've created something that's sustainable, um, which I think is something that Olmsted would have, would have said about what he and Vaux did with, with, with Central Park. Um, and he said, Parks and boulevards are part of the self-preserving instinct 
uh, of civilization. And I love that phrase, the self-preserving instinct of civilization. And I think that is what George Kessler represent, represented in Kansas City in the age of giants in Kansas City. J.C. Nichols, R.A. Long, uh, Kessler, August Meyer, uh, and, uh, and they were inspired uh, by, by uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. And a great biography of him has been written by Justin Martin, whom I welcome now. Well, thanks a lot for coming out tonight, and um, thanks for the introduction, Crosby. And, and I very much enjoyed the, um, the pamphlets you read from from 1917 with the quotations from George Kessler and Frederick Longstead and others. And um, I should say in the outset, I actually grew up in Overland Park, and I went to Old Mission Junior High School and Shawnee Mission North. So it's very nice to be back in Kansas City, and it's also an honor to be speaking here at the library. And my book is called um, genius of Place, The Life of Frederick Law Olmsted, and he was a restless genius, so I think the best thing to do is to kind of break up my speech into a couple different pieces. First of all, I'm going to describe the very circuitous route that he took to becoming a landscape architect. Then I'm going to describe some of his great works and how those works were actually informed by all the various career eddies that he traveled down, very, the various dead ends that he went down. Those actually really informed some of his greatest works, which I'll describe. Then I'm going to talk about his influence on the landscape of Kansas City, and there'll certainly be time for questions, which I'll be glad to entertain. Frederick Lohmsa was born in Hartford, Connecticut in 1822. He was born into a pretty prosperous family. His father was a dry goods merchant. And this was the habit in that era with prosperous families. Olmsted was sent away for his schooling. He was sent away to a whole series of arrangements with very poor country parsons. And these parsons were just besieged and beset. Uh, they had their parsonage duties. Many of them were running small farms on the side in order to make extra income. That left them very little focus and very little time for their third role, which is acting as educators. And Olmsted was a very mischievous boy. He took advantage of the situation. He was in the habit of sneaking out of these parsonages and wandering around, setting traps for quail and fishing. Uh, he didn't learn too much, didn't get too much schooling, but he certainly deepened his appreciation for landscape, and particularly the landscape of his native Connecticut. Now, when Olmsted was 14 years old, he developed a very serious case of poison sumac, and it spread into his eyes. At this point, he contrived to get a letter from a doctor, which indicated that he no longer needed to continue with his schooling. <laughs> he was delighted. <laughs> but this also meant that at a very young age, he needed to find some kind of pro profession. So the first thing that Olmsted lit up on was in some ways very logical, in some ways highly illogical. He decided he wanted to become a surveyor. That was certainly a profession that was available to someone with modest schooling, at least in that era. At the same time, surveying requires eagle sharp eyesight. And Olmsted had just had this bout, this very serious bout with poison sumac. But never mind, he went ahead with this in any case. He identified a man who would act as his, as his supervisor and he would be an apprentice. And then Olmsted pr proceeded to absolutely abuse the situation. While pretending to learn the useful skill of surveying, Olmsted wandered around, fishing, hunting, paddling in a canoe. He learned nothing about surveying, but he did manage to deepen his appreciation for landscape, particularly the landscape of his native Connecticut. Now, at this point, his father decided, time for Olmsted to get serious, time for him to buckle down. So his father arranged for Olmsted to move to Brooklyn, and he got Olmsted a job through his connections working for an importing firm in Manhattan. Olmsted was deeply lonely in Brooklyn, and he hated the job at the importing firm in Manhattan. He hated the fact that he was tied to a desk. He hated the long hours. He hated the regimentation. There's really only one thing he liked, and that was periodically he was called upon to go on board of ships that were docked in New York Harbor and inventory their wares. And while doing this, it occurred to him a new profession, something else that he might do. He decided to become a sailor. And Olmsted came by this desire honestly as well, because a whole long line of Olmsted forebears had gone to sea. So in April of 1843, Olmsted set out from New York Harbor aboard a ship called the Ronaldson, headed for China. And on July 4th, 1843, as the Ronaldson was rounding the Cape of Good Horn, Cape of Good Hope, rather, right beneath the southern tip of Africa, it encountered an absolutely ferocious snowstorm. Now, the Ronaldson at this point was traveling through the Southern Hemisphere. and the Southern Hemisphere, it's actually possible on July 4th to have some pretty ferocious winter weather. And in this case, Olmsted took a look around at his fellow sailors, many of whom were very seasoned, 
and he could see panic in their eyes. He realized this was a serious storm. About this point, Captain Fox, the captain of the Ronaldson, gave the order to furl sail. What this meant was roll up the sails. The, the, the ship, um, the sails were actually acting as a detriment at this point. The ship was just being whipped this way and that by the wild wind. So they rolled up the sails. Olmsted and his fellow crewmen went below deck, and for three days and three nights, they're just tossed on the ocean almost like a cork, completely unmanned, completely uncontrolled. Olmsted expected at any moment that the Ronaldson would crack open, he'd be pitched into the icy sea at a certain death. Fortunately, that did not happen. Olmsted continued on to China. Uh, he delivered his, his um, or, the, or the ship rather, delivered its, its load of American goods and it picked up a load of Chinese tea. As it headed back to the United States, Olmsted encountered all kinds of privations. He didn't get enough food, he didn't get enough water, he didn't get enough sleep. He watched as his fellow sailors were whipped for even the minorest of infractions. When the Ronaldson docked in New York Harbor in April of 1844, and when Olmsted disembarked on the dry land, he vowed never, ever to go to sea again. <laughs> but that only meant he needed to find a new profession. And so at this point, Olmsted looked around. He hit on the idea of becoming a farmer. Once again, this made perfect sense. Farming was certainly a profession that was available to someone, at least in this era, with pretty modest um, formal schooling. What's more, farming was the profession practiced by 70% of the population. And Olmsted decided he didn't want to just become a farmer. He wanted to become a scientific farmer. He was having the very first pangs of a desire to create some kind of social reform. And he perceived that if he, uh, and, and the other thing that Olmsted was, he didn't have much formal schooling, but he was extremely well read. And so Olmsted perceived that he could read the latest technical and agricultural journals, and then he could disseminate the best practices about agriculture that he gleaned to his fellow farmers, many of whom were illiterate. And this way he could fulfill a sort of social reform responsibility or obligation. So Olmsted identified a man who received a commendation for running a model scientific farm. Olmsted then arranged to serve an apprenticeship under him. And when that was over, Olmsted went off and started his life as a farmer. And true to his word, he really was very able, very good at growing crops. And true to his word, he really did fulfill a kind of social reform um, obligation. He actually really did read the latest technical journals and disseminate the information to his fellow farmers. But then Olmsted learned that his younger brother, John, was planning to take a walking tour across England, and he became almost pathologically jealous. He could not believe that he was stuck on the farm while his brother was going off to have this great adventure. <laughs> So Olmsted wrote a series of letters to his father, pleading and begging to be allowed to leave the farm and to go and join his brother on this walking tour. Now you might wonder why a man who is now in his mid-20s would have to beg his father's permission. Well, his father held the mortgage on the farm. But <laughs> his father was also a very kindly, very generous man, particularly by 19th century fatherly standards. And so he agreed to let Olmsted go. And furthermore, he gave Olmsted some money for the trip. Now, when Olmsted returned from his walking tour, he was met with a very fortunate circumstance or coincidence. One of Olmsted's neighbors, one of the neighboring farmers, was a weekend hobby farmer named George Putnam. Now, George Putnam, now th at this point, Olmsted was farming on Staten Island. And Staten Island was not yet part of New York City. It was just an island off the tip of Manhattan. And George Putnam was in the habit of working all week in Manhattan. Then he'd come out on the weekends to Staten Island, just kind of put around on the farm. And George Putnam is a name that many people here might still recognize to this day because Putnam's, the publishing company he founded, is still around. At this point, Putnam was working on a brand new innovation. He's one of the very first people to publish paperback books. He was publishing all kinds of different paperback books. He was publishing uh, treatises on philosophy, collections of, pro of poetry, uh, collections of short stories. So he approached Olmsted and asked him if he would be interested in producing an account to be published in paperback of his recent um, trip to England. Olmsted readily agreed, and Olmsted wrote a book called Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. Now, this book was met with extremely tepid reviews. <laughs> it sold very, very slowly. But Olmsted had now made a kind of incredible transition. He'd gone from being a surveyor to a clerk to a sailor to a farmer to a writer. And now comes an absolutely extraordinary coincidence. This is the early 1850s, and is a brand new newspaper called the New York Daily Times. A few years hence, it would drop the daily and become merely the New York Times. And it was in a competitive fight for its life. This was the era when most big cities had about a dozen dailies. 
And Henry Raymond, the editor of the New York Times, was trying to figure out a way to set the Times apart from its large field of competition. And he came to the conclusion that the way to set the Times apart was veracity. This was the era of yellow journalism, and a dozen or so other papers were in the habit of producing um, very broad accounts of things, making things up whole cloth. Um, and so he came to the conclusion that if the Times was to practice objective journalism, insofar as that's possible, he would be able to set himself apart from these dozen or so competitors. What's more, Henry Raymond, the editor of the Times, was very committed to covering some of the big stories of the day. And one of the big stories he chose to focus on was this was, the point, this was the point in the early 1850s when tensions over the issue of slavery that existed really from the inception of the country, they were once again at one of their periodic flashpoints. It looked at this point as if there might be outright violence, there might even be a civil war. And so Raymond decided he wanted to dispatch a reporter to travel through the American <coughs> South and to treat the region almost as if it was a foreign country. Olmsted applied for this job. He had a five minute interview and he was handed this absolute dream assignment. Now you might think Olmsted seemed pretty unqualified for this, but he did have a writing credit. He'd written this book, Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. But maybe more importantly, Olmsted was a farmer by trade and the South in this era was nothing if not an agrarian society. So in the autumn of 1852, after the harvest was over, because Olmsted was still a farmer by trade, he set off for the South. And the only way to describe it is nothing could have prepared Henry Raymond, the editor of the Times. Nothing could have prepared anyone for what an able reporter Olmsted proved to be. He went everywhere and he talked to everyone. He talked to plantation owners, he talked to slaves, he talked to poor white farmers. He produced a, a series of spectacular dispatches that helped put the brand new New York Times on the map. And so, and, and, and one of, and, and um, in 1861, those dispatches were collected in a book called The Cotton Kingdom. And here it is 150 years later, The Cotton Kingdom is still in print, still in print to this day. And I can tell you, if you want to get a window into the South on the eve of the Civil War, you can watch the movie Gone with the Wind, which is fictional, but it actually provides really telling and useful insights into the antebellum South. Or you can read The Cotton Kingdom, which contains Olmsted's incredible reportage about the South on the eve of the Civil War. So Olmsted had now made the transition into what he called the literary republic. And next he landed a really plum gig. He became the editor of a magazine called Putnam's. And Putnam's was a competitor of another new magazine called Harper's. And Putnam's had just a stellar stable of writers. It published Emerson, Thoreau, Longfellow. While working at Putnam's, Olmsted copy edited a couple of short stories by Herman Melville. Now, while working, at home, uh, while working at Putnam's, Olmsted also became more deeply involved in abolition. Given everything he'd witnessed while he was traveling through the South, he was very eager and very intent on being involved in this cause. And here I wanted to insert a kind of historical footnote that has a lot of local resonance. Um, in 1855, a man named James Abbott traveled from Lawrence, from Kansas, um, to the East, trying to gather money so that he could buy ammunition for his militia. Uh, he headed up a, a militia in Kansas, a free state militia, which was devoted to making sure that when and if Kansas entered statehood, when it became part of the Union, that it would be as a free state, not as a slave state. And Abbott first of all went to um, Providence, Rhode Island, in Hartford, Connecticut. He gathered enough money to buy a hundred what were nicknamed Beecher's Bibles. These were sharp rifles, sharps rifles. Um, then he went to New York and he naturally, the person he chose to connect with there was Olmsted. And he asked Olmsted if Olmsted would go to some of his various connections, particularly in the literary world, and solicit funds to raise money um, to purchase weapons for the militia. And Olmsted readily agreed, and Olmsted reached out, among other people, to Horace Greeley, who was then the editor of the New York Tribune. Horace Greeley is the very person who coined the term Bleeding Kansas. Olmsted managed to raise about $300, and Abbott referred to Olmsted as a prompt and energetic friend of Kansas. Olmsted then used the $300 to purchase a howitzer. He kept Abbott apprised of his activities by writing him a series of letters in which Olmsted used a kind of code. He used the letter H for howitzer. It's not a very impressive, it's a pretty crackable code. <laughs> <laughs> but it, cer it certainly reflected the fact that he, he was aware that he was involved in a dangerous activity. Olmsted, once he purchased the howitzer, he actually broke it into pieces. 
um, disassembled it and mailed it separately. Again, kind of an acknowledgement. This is a pretty dangerous activity that he was involved with. Wanted to make sure that he avoided detection. When the howitzer arrived in Lawrence, it was reassembled and placed in front of the Free State Hotel. The Free State Hotel is on the current ground, the current place where the Eldridge House Hotel is. Um, late in 1855, a band of marauding South Carolinians, as part of the bloody Kansas struggle, stole the cannon, the howitzer. But the howitzer was retrieved through a prisoner exchange. It went back and sat in front of the Lawrence Free State Hotel. It comported itself admirably throughout the Civil War. And after the Civil War, the howitzer was, reti was retired. It's now part of the permanent collection of the Kansas State Historical Society. So Olmsted was very much part of the literary republic at this point, working at Putnam's Magazine, copy editing short stories by Herman Melville. He was also deeply involved in the cause of abolition. But now comes an absolutely cataclysmic event in United States economic history. It's come to be known as the Panic of 1857. It was an extremely rapid downward spiral in economic conditions. Putnam's, the magazine Olmsted was working for, went belly up. Olmsted was out of a job. And he took a new job that was extraordinarily modest for someone who'd lately been rubbing shoulders with Emerson and, and working with Horace Greeley on, on abolition issues. He took a job in which he was charged with clearing a very kind of scraggly, unattractive piece of land. He was charged with knocking down shanties and draining swamps in a very scraggly piece of land that was prosaically named for its position in the middle of Manhattan. It was called Central Park. He was clearing this piece of land for someone else's design. Enter Calvert Vox. Vox was an English trained architect and Vox took one look at the existing plan for Central Park and he felt that it was unbelievably, unbelievably amateurish. And Vox had friends in high places. He recently designed the Fifth Avenue mansion of one of the board members of the future Central Park. So Vox started going to the board of Central Park and saying, first, this is a really amateurish design. And secondly, Vox said, in England, where I'm from, if we want to get the best design, we hold a public design competition. The board listened to Vox. They tabled the existing design for Central Park, and they announced a public competition for a new design for Central Park. At this point, Vox sought out Olmsted now, and wanted Olmsted to be his partner in this design competition. Now, Vox could not have cared a whit for these purposes about the fact that Olmsted cut this figure as a member of the literary republic, that he rubbed shoulders with the likes of Emerson and Longfold, Longfellow. That meant nothing to Vox. The reason Vox paired up with Olmsted or wanted to pair up with Olmsted was because Olmsted had been out on this sh um, shabby piece of land, knocking down shanties and draining swamps, and Vox perceived that they would have a leg up in the competition because Olmsted literally knew the lay of the land. So Olmsted and Vox teamed up, and they started working on a design. And it's kind of parallel to how I earlier described the southern journey that he took for the New York Times. Nothing could have prepared Vox. Nothing could have prepared anyone. Nothing could have prepared Olmsted for what incredible ideas he brought to this new project. Just all these amazing ideas came bubbling up. And when Olmsted and Vox turned in their design, they were the clear winners. There were 33 different people who entered the competition. The best way to describe it is 32 of them rate somewhere between a B minus and a flat F. Olmsted and Vox turned an A plus. It was instantly recognized as the right design to proceed with for Central Park. And I'll give you just one example of, of one of the really amazing, innovative ideas they brought to this particular design competition. Um, the design competition had various mandatory elements or spelled out by the Central Park Board. And one of the mandatory elements was that there needed to be four roads or roads crossing Central Park at four points. And Central Park is a rectangle, a very narrow rectangle. And the other 32 contestants, they just complied with this. They basically, they just had, had their park designs crossed in four spots by roads. And they produced very cribbed, cramped designs. It was not possible for them to have a kind of, any kind of expansive meadow. It was not possible for these designs to have any kind of long view. Olmsted and Vox also complied with the need for there to be four roads crossing the park, but they came up with this idea that they called sunken transverses. They dug subterranean channels that would cross the park at these four points, and then they built land bridges over the channels at certain points. And what this did was it opened up the park plan. Now it was possible to have an expansive meadow. Now it was possible to have some kind of long view. And it also meant that traffic crossing the park uh, would not be at eye level. As Olmsted put it, 
As you're walking across the park, you won't have your view distracted by clattering dung cart, as he said. And this design innovation continues to pay dividends to this day. As many of you, I'm sure, visited Central Park, and as you're walking through the park, you can be very unaware that very close by, there are taxis or buses hurtling past, but they're in these subterranean channels. And in fact, you don't hear them so much either because they're muffled because they're traveling beneath ground level. So Olmsted and Vox, they proceeded with their plan for Central Park, and they were pretty far along. They'd done much of what they wanted to do. What they hadn't done was in train, was getting ready to be done when the Civil War broke out in 1861. At this point, Olmsted um, certainly wanted to be involved in the Union cause, so he headed down to Washington, and he headed up the outfit that, that Crosby referred to in the intro, um, the United States Sanitary Commission. And as he said, the United States Sanitary Commission was actually a forerunner of the Red Cross. It provided just immeasurable relief to battlefield wounded during the Civil War uh, and with, with Olmsted as, as its head. But come the Battle of Gettysburg, Olmsted started to grow restless. Gettysburg is kind of a, a dividing point in the Civil War. At this point, it became clear that the North was going to emerge victorious, the South was going to be defeated. It was really just a matter of time and terms. At this point, Olmsted started to think it was only a matter of time before his assignment with the United States Sanitary Commission um, um, was over, and then he'd have to look for another job. And Olmsted, well, one of the interesting things is Olmsted did not consider becoming a landscape architect at this point, the very profession that he and Vox had pioneered in America. Um, he had a masterpiece to his credit in Central Park, yet he didn't really think that there would be too many other cities that would want parks built. And so instead, Olmsted, at the tail end of the Civil War, he went out to California and he headed up a gold mine. But then the Civil War ended, and in the North at least there started to be an economic boom, and, and suddenly all these cities started clamoring for parks. So Olmsted and Vox teamed up together, and they did a whole series of parks and other landscapes for cities all over the country. Now, Olmsted and Vox, they never got along well. They were always at each other's throats. So pretty soon, their partnership broke up, and Olmsted continued on solo. And the best, and I, I, I described earlier how I'll, I'll describe several of his best known or most impressive landscape designs in the context of once he became a solo pr practitioner in landscape architecture, all these different ideas from all these different professions and all these different dead ends that he traveled down, they all sort of kind of bubbling to the fore. And that's why Olmsted's designs are so special, so spectacular, so set apart as they draw on all these other disciplines and all these other ideas. I'll describe just a few of them, um, starting with the grounds of the US Capitol in Washington, DC. Now, Olmsted started working on this particular project, laying out the grounds for the Capitol in 1874. And the first thing he focused on was creating some kind of system of circulation. Um, in this era, there were 41 different points at which you could enter the Capitol grounds. And people were in the practice of just entering at any one of these 41 points and just making a beeline for whatever entrance of the Capitol they wanted to go into. And it created this kind of harried grid work of people just crossing one another from any of these 41 points. Um, it was a very unattractive circulation system. Well, Olmsted sat down and he thought, okay, people are going to enter at any one of these 41 points. I'm not going to change that because these are roads and existing roads and carriage paths and so forth. But he decided to set up a system that was kind of almost like tributaries feeding into larger tributaries, feeding into rivers. So whichever one of the 41 points someone entered at, they would be fed first into a tributary, a pathway that fed into a larger tributary, that fed into just a handful of very wide pathways that traveled in a nice sinuous way and delivered people right to the entrance of the Capitol. Now Olmsted's client in this case, which was Congress, was utterly puzzled about why Olmsted was so fixated on this circulation system. They had hired him to create a beautiful design for the Capitol grounds, and here he was thinking about paths and roadways. But this had everything to do with Olmsted's earlier experience being a farmer. As a farmer, Olmsted had noticed that he was well aware, and it happened to him many times, that you could grow crops really well, but on the way to market, if your wagon got stuck in a, wire, in, a, in a miry road, your crops were ruined, your yield was ruined, it was a disaster. And so throughout Olmsted's career, whenever he would work on plans, often the client would start out being puzzled. They'd wonder, because he would start out by con trying to come up with some kind of circulation system. Often the client would be very puzzled, and he would explain to them, it doesn't matter 
how nice of a landscape, how beautiful a landscape I create for you. If there is an irrational and logical way for people to be conducted through this landscape, this landscape will be a failure. This was completely born of his experience as a farmer. A second landscape I wanted to describe in this context, or in these terms, are the grounds of the Columbian Exposition, um, the Chicago World's Fair that was held in 1893. This is one of Olmsted's most visionary, wild, out there plans ever. Um, the World's Fair was to be on the banks, on the, on the shores of Lake Michigan, and Olmsted decided he wanted to cut channels from Lake Michigan um, that would feed water onto the fairgrounds, and then there would be this system of winding lagoons that would literally travel through the fairgrounds. This would also be a way that visitors to the World's Fair, they could travel from point to point, go from attraction to attraction by boat. And Olmsted had a vivid, almost hallucinatory idea of what he wanted these boats to be. He decided he wanted people to be transferred, trans, um, transported by little tiny boats that held about four people maximum, had very bright awnings, and this was based on the Chinese sampans that he had seen while traveling, while sailing to China 50 years earlier. He had an incredibly vivid idea of exactly how he wanted these boats to look. Well, Daniel Burnham, who was the superintendent of the fair, uh, he had other ideas. He thought this was a preposterous idea. I mean, why in the world, when you had this crowded fair, would you be transporting people four at a time in a handful of little boats? And so behind Olmsted's back, Burnham forged a relationship with a steamship company. And this made perfect sense. I mean, if you're going to have people travel over these lagoons, have them crowded into steamships to do that. When Olmsted caught wind of this, he was apoplectic. And he set Burnham a series of just maniacal, obsessive, but deeply reasoned letters in which he made the argument. He summoned the argument, first of all, that the World's Fair was going to be only for a season. It was just going to be for three months, and then it would be done, and it would be consigned to memory. And Olmsted made the argument that it would be better for the larger number of people if there were just a handful of small, brightly colored boats that were traveling over um, the fairgrounds. Later, when people look back on this event, they'd remember this kind of casual ambience. Whereas if you had this big honking steamships traveling through and people leaning over the sides, waving their hats, and the steam whistles going off and so forth, it would create a different, more disruptive memory for people. And um, Burnham, as anyone who's familiar with him, was no shrinking violet. He had a pretty indomitable will. But in this case, Olmsted carried the day. Burnham backed down. He canceled the contract with the steamship company. And when the fair opened in the spring of 1893, there were just a handful of small, brightly colored boats that only a handful of people were able to travel over the lagoons on, but presumably a large number of people had wonderful memories of the sort of the, the languid ambience that that created. The third type of landscape that I wanted to describe, and in this case it's actually landscapes and what its sort of antecedent in Olmsted's experience is, are his park systems. And there's actually a whole number of these. Um, Olmsted and Vox did their very first park system in Buffalo in 1868. And when Olmsted went solo, he did a whole series of park systems in Louisville, Kentucky, Rochester, New York, Milwaukee, and then famously he did the Emerald Necklace in Boston. And the idea behind the park system was that you'd have, a syst you'd have a series, two or three or four parks in a city, and they would be interconnected. And this had some real advantages. I mean, one advantage is instead of being tied to a single piece of land, such as, say, Central Park, in which you're tied to its topography and its attributes, you could have several different parks in a city that had varied attributes. Maybe one of them was kind of hilly. Maybe another one had a very nice natural lake. But way more importantly than that, and this is the reason Olmsted was so drawn to the idea of the park system, was that you would have a whole series of parks in the middle of the city that drew on a whole lot of different neighborhoods and caused a bunch of different kind of people of different backgrounds to be able to mix and mingle. This was so very rooted, the park system idea, in Olmsted's time traveling through the South for the brand New York Times. Well, Olmsted traveled through the South, one of his most enduring observations was that the South in this era was in the grip of a kind of cultural poverty. And he attributed this poverty, this cultural poverty, to being because people lived at such great remove, one from another. Plantations were so far apart that there wasn't much opportunity for cultural commerce. Olmsted observed in his reporting that the whole time he traveled through the South, he never saw a work by Shakespeare. He rarely saw a piano fort. 
And so when he started designing these park systems, part of his idea was to create communal space, places where people could come together and mix and mingle and share ideas in a way so different from what he'd observed while, while he traveled through the South. So um, I, wa I, wanted to, I wanted to close now by describing um, Olmsted's influence on the landscape of Kansas City. And in 1893, while Olmsted was working on the Chicago World's Fair, uh, he wrote a harried and nervous letter to his partners back in Brookline, Massachusetts, um, where he inquired about his workload, his ever-growing slate of assignments, and he asked, am I needed at Kansas City? And the answer was yes, he certainly was. However, according to my research, um, although he visited Kansas City on certain occasions, he never visited Kansas City in the capacity of doing any kind of substantive park work. Fortunately, at this exact same time, though, at the very time which Olmsted wrote this harried, nervous letter, a man named George Kessler was forging a connection with the Kansas City Park, um, park Board. And Kessler was, couldn't have been a better choice because Kessler was a protege of Olmsted's. Earlier in his career, Kessler had written a whole series of letters to Olmsted in which he asked Olmsted advice on landscape architecture, in which he asked Olmsted what books he might read to become better apprised of the field. Um, ultimately, Kessler became the superintendent of the Kansas City Parks. He was involved in the, um, the, in the design of Swope Park, of Spring Valley Park, of Penn Valley Park, and of a whole series of smaller neighborhood parks such as Blenheim Park and Truce Park. He was also involved in laying out various parkways such as the Paseo and Ward Parkway. And, uh, and in doing this, in doing this work, Kessler remained so very true. He hewed so very much to the vision of his mentor, Olmsted. Um, with the parkways, um, parkway, was, parkway is literally a concept that Olmsted and Vox invented. They invented the parkway and they in fact coined the term. It's a much abused term. You can go anywhere in the country and you can find pr some pretty homely roads which are described as parkways. <laughs> but the original idea at least was that a parkway was supposed to be a very vigorously thoughtful designed roadway. And Olmsted and Vox's conception was maybe there would be a median that was very carefully planted. Maybe there would be a circle of some kind. It wasn't a circle because of any particular traffic reason. It was a circle because it would create attractive properties arrayed around it. Maybe there could be a fountain or some other, a statue or something in the middle. It would create variation. It would create an interestingly landscape road. Well, Kessler certainly fo followed through with this vision in designing parkways such as Ward Parkway and the Paseo in Kansas City. Kessler also remained very true to Olmsted's vision with the various parks he worked on, such as Swope Park. It's hard to imagine now, but when Olmsted came on the scene in 1857 with Central Park, there's actually a kind of debate in America about which direction parks should go. Um, Olmsted favored what might be called naturalistic parks, but there was also sort of a movement or an idea that maybe a proper park should be what I call an imperial park. An imperial park is a park that has elaborate fountainry and triumphal arches, and Olmsted was very against this. Olmsted argued that in an imperial style park, as a person is walking through it, let's say you're walking through an archway, for instance, that archway is a constant reminder of a person's lowly station in life. You, you naturally, as you walk through the archway, you wonder, you know, who is this built in tribute to? What great military figure or, or statesman <laughs> is, this, is this built in, in, um, in honor of? And it kind of is a reminder of a person's lowly station in life. Olmsted argued for naturalistic parks for two main reasons. First of all, you go back to the 19th century, it was an era of really teeming cities. A lot of people were living in, in very packed, tight, slum-like conditions. And a naturalistic park meant what they would have as kind of a respite from that was, was nature. They'd be able to get out quickly from city conditions, crowded urban conditions, into something that felt more rural. But Olmsted also made the argument very clearly that one of the reasons he favored a naturalistic approach is because nature belongs to everyone. It doesn't make any kind of class distinctions or economic distinctions. So a person wandering through a naturalistic park won't have those constant reminders of their station. Instead, nature belongs to everyone. So I wanted to close by saying that, that it's wonderful to be here in Kansas City. Uh, I had a very nice time actually visiting Swope Park today. And it's great to see here in the 21st century that Olmsted's vivid democratic vision continues to hold around the country and in Kansas City as well. Thank you so much. And <laughs>